in forgiving of others, thus stopping the wheel of karma. We need to focus on becoming more service to others on a daily basis. And we need to focus on raising our vibration and our consciousness. Hello. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us here this, this weekend. It's been wonderful getting to meet every one of y'all. And I have to say, some of the gifts that were given to me were extremely moving. I really appreciate how service to others this group is. Thank you. Well, yesterday my presentation was a little bit short because I put end of presentation in the wrong place. So we got about two thirds of the way through my presentation. So I, I fixed it, but uh, I think it worked out because I heard that there were a lot of people that had questions that they wanted answered. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do the last third of my presentation from yesterday, and then we're gonna spend more time on Q&A if that's okay with y'all. This leaves off right, this starts right where we left off. After the sphere started to appear in the solar system and SOHO was ca capturing images and the secret space program had begun to track the spheres, we have uh, me coming forward and I came forward on, on a uh, forum first. And uh, uh, the name used to, it was good my last name, Texas State Guard, is what it stood for, but they wanted to get clever to try to, I guess, make it look like uh, good ETXSG. So I had a lot of people trying to guess what that might mean, but there was no big mystery there. So I, I came out, I, I wanted to be anonymous in the beginning. I wanted to feed this information to various researchers because I saw disinformation coming out so I began to do uh, some uh, work on a forum, Project Avalon, and taught uh, the one truth. And at that point, I, I was wanting to remain anonymous, but as we see, that didn't work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, October the 13th, 2014, I sent David Wilcock an email coming forward, and I had spoken to him since about 2009, giving him various insider information, but we really didn't, uh, didn't really connect, only through email. And uh, after I sent him an email with a bunch of links to the forum posts I've made, and asked him to take a look at it, and if it piqued his interest to give me a, a call and we'd talk about it, well, he, he went and he looked through the forum and he called me almost immediately. We can. That's the original email I sent. I copied uh, Ben Fulford in as well, because I knew they worked together sometimes. Yeah, thanks. On December the 5th of 2015, the, the cabal decided that working along with the reptilians, they would use this new exotic weapon that they had and it was stationed in Australia. And I was told that the targeting center was in South, uh, Southern Africa. What occurred is they located one of these spheres and they fired a massive energy beam at it. And using an Aikido principle, the blue avians or the spheres themselves just redirected that energy back at where it came from and it uh, destroyed the, the base and killed a lot of the people that were present and reptilians that were present for the attack. Okay. <clears throat> right after this happened, the outer barrier was erected. 
So the cabal, they had an idea that the spheres were not here for their agenda, but they weren't quite sure. But as soon as they fired on the sphere and the destruction occurred down on the ba at the base that they had, this outer barrier was erected. And this was to prevent all non-terrestrials and humans from coming and going from the solar system. It was, it was to mainly prevent the reptilians from escaping and, and going to another star system that they controlled to hide. Furthermore, a no-fly zone was put up around the Earth. In the beginning, it was a blue sphere. Then it phased out, and the Secret Space Program Alliance took over patrolling the, the skies above the Earth. And the SSP Alliance, they were behind the other groups technology-wise. They were given information on how to build technology by the Blue Avians that was purely for defensive purposes. There was no offensive um, way to use these technologies. On December 11th, I think we've all seen the story where the, uh, there was an astronaut that screamed, uh, that screamed, oh my God, because she saw a UFO outside the ISS. And that, that occurred very soon after the sphere was fired on and the uh, outer barrier was erected. And there's a clip. On February 18th, we saw in the news that a giant plume had appeared in the southern hemisphere of Mars. Scientists were unable to explain what may have caused it. It showed up in various news reports, as you see up there. And right there is an image of a very large plume. This turned out to be one of two atrocities. This was the Mars atrocity. The Secret Space Program Alliance ended up being responsible for this. <clears throat> they had, the Secret Space Program Alliance was made up of people who had defected from the other space programs. And we had recent defectors from Dart Fleet and the ICC that had actionable intelligence about a base, <clears throat> a base on Mars that produced a critical piece of equipment, a critical piece of technology. They saw the opportunity to attack it, so they did, without any type of approval from the rest of the SSP Alliance Council. One more, I'm getting ahead of my slides. Yes, <clears throat> this facility on Mars had 250,000 human being slaves that were forced to produce this technology. And they were seen as uh, just uh, acceptable casualties by the SSP Alliance. It was, that's a very large amount of people. R right in the same 24, 48 hour time frame, there was <clears throat> a big earthquake off the coast of South Carolina. And the earthquake was the report of the weapon that was used on a reptilian base. And this reptilian base had 700 humans there that were also slaves and were being used sort of like um, test animals in some of the places where they, you know, f pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, that kind of thing. Eight days after the second atrocity, the second attack, The, uh, the cabal begins to Im immediately accelerate their, their uh, partial and limited disclosure plan. <clears throat> On February 26, a very artificial looking structure and light were announced as being found on Ceres. You see the size of Ceres compared to Earth. 
and there you see the, the bright spot. And as y'all know, no matter which angle this heavenly body was photographed from, you could see a reflection, which should not be possible. If you have a flat surface or a cur even a curved surface that's reflective, at a certain point, you're not going to be able to see a reflection. There we go. That's, it's taken from several different perspectives. And here we see straight lines and, um, what is that, an octagon? I can't see. Very unnatural looking ge geography, if you ask me. And the next day, the um, Gonzalez had been in contact with the Blue Avians the same amount of time as I had. And he was contacted out of the blue, and, uh, and my name came up as the person that they wanted to be their delegate. And he was confused in the beginning because he expected you know, a, a lieutenant commander or some other, um, something to be in front of the name other than just a civilian type name. Yeah, and uh, they, they started to dig around to find out more about me, who I was, where I was, and there was not a whole lot of information to find in the beginning. In the beginning, they, they found that most of my record had been redacted or expunged. So they found a little bit of information about me and uh, uh, began contact with me. On March 1st, I was transported to a sphere for my first time. And in previous to that, Tyrair had first approached me in dreams and then started to appear in front of me in my house physically. So going to being picked up by one of these orbs for the first time was an extremely wild experience. It was that's an artist's representation of me being taken. <laughs> okay. An artist created this 3D video of me standing in my living room, and it, a blue sphere comes in and circles around and encapsulates me and then takes off the ceiling. From, from inside the blue orb, it acted as a technology or a filter that allowed me to see sp the spheres that were sp spread out in space. Without, the, without looking through the wall of the sphere, they were invisible. You couldn't see them. And the, the view of all these three different sized spheres all around spread out was amazing. And uh, an artist created this representation and this one as well. And this is depicting some of the crackling energy that, that these uh, spheres are absorbing, absorbing and mitigating. And you can see the crackling that occurs between the spheres of the energy that's coming into the solar system. It's another representation. And I think we've all seen this image. The artist is a well-known artist uh, his name is Android. Some of y'all may know him. He usually does ex beautiful art to music at symphonies or jazz concerts. And he sat down at Gaia to do this image with us. And in the beginning, he wasn't too happy. He thought it looked like Howard the Duck. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same artist that did the other 3D representation. He did this one of raw tier air to give it a little bit more depth so you have a better idea of what he looked like. This is another one standing. Yeah. <clears throat> now, yes, eight feet tall. And I'm sitting on the couch with my dog next to me. And she's got her head, right, her chin right here on my knee, and I'm petting her. And tear air just appears in the room. I jump, my dog jumps, <laughs> and turns her head up and gives me this, this look like, what the? And then she's shaking, and she puts her head back down, and then she slides her nose behind my back until he left. <laughs> but it startled both of us pretty badly. 
that's the perspective we were sitting at. We were in an L-shaped couch, and we were sitting just before where it curves on the L. I think I have, I have a photograph of the actual room. Yeah, that's, we appeared right there, and we were sitting right here. Next. I was next invited to appear before the SSP Alliance and their council. I was giving no other information. I had no idea what to expect. In the beginning, the SSP would come and pick me up in this, what they called a dart, and it had a place for a, a pilot and a co-pilot in the front, and then three seats in the back. And the, uh, it, was, it was about the, about the size of a car, and a little bit pyramid, pyramid shaped on top. It was triangular. Is there refusing to go? Oh, there we go. And there's, you can see the couch where in, in the other photograph you could see, I guess the placement, tear air would be just at that angle when he appeared. But uh, to be picked up, I had to walk out into the backyard and get into the dart. They, they quit picking me up in the dart after it started to attract too much attention. <laughs> Next picture. That, that I walked, I would come out, I would walk through into this little patio area and then directly into the backyard. And that was the, the backyard. There's an area right out there that, uh, the, the area that you can see has the least grass possible. That's where it was coming down to pick me up. My wife was uh, scratching her head a lot in the beginning when I was telling her about all this. And, uh, after one of, the, one of my visitations, I told her I'd been on a trip, and she went out in the backyard, and it, the ground was wet, and she saw my footprints going out and then disappear, and then about 20 or 30 feet way on the other side, my feet began again and walked back to uh, walk inside. In the beginning, she didn't know what to think, but uh, she ended up uh, uh, having confirmations very soon. Well, the Dodge, I mean the Dodge. <laughs> the Dart picked me up and took me to the <laughs> Lunar Operation Command. I don't think Dodge made it. <laughs> Probably Boeing or something. When I arrived, I noticed a bunch of civilians. Some were wearing their day clothes, some were wearing pajamas. And they were walking around with a very bewildered look on their face. I forgot to mention when the dart picked me up this time, when the door, the hatch opened, I looked in, I, there was a girl sitting in the middle seat and she just, she was just very excited. And she was like, isn't this great? Isn't this exciting? Do you know where we're going? And she was just really excited. And I didn't expect another person to be in the, the vehicle. And we, we flew up to the LOC. People were walking around being told, you know, follow the red line, you know, to get over to the VIP area where there were, there were two presentation rooms side by side. And all the civilians were being walked into this presentation room. I still don't know what happened in there but I was walked in to another room where all the SSP Alliance was, and also there was some civilian-looking uh, leadership that were there. I was officially introduced to Gonzalez, who pretty much walked up to me directly when I walked in that room, and immediately I recognized him. I had seen him in 2013, right after my detached retina, and I, I had to be taken for the Mayan to help me with, you know, the full recall memories I was having. He was the person that was the military observer there, and I just, I had no idea who he was until this point. <clears throat> with no warning or any idea of why I was there or what I was a what I was supposed to do, I was walked right to the middle 
of the presentation area, the, the presentation room had about two to 300 seats that angled up kind of like in a college auditorium that you've seen. And it went around like that. And it had it looked like cherry wood on the walls going around. And of course, I was walked to the front, not, not told anything. I, just, I was walked to the front, and Gonzalez pointed down for, to where I needed to stand. And I had very quickly gotten ready that morning. I put on a NASA cap that I received on vacation down to Houston. And I walked up, and I was getting eyeballed very heavily by these guys. And one of them said, take off that ridiculous cover. And I took the hat off, and I kind of flung it. And when I did, he saw in my hand, my daughter had painted with face paint a dinosaur <laughs> on my hand. And one of them said, what the hell are you doing with a reptilian on your hand? And I, I tried to wipe it off on my leg. It wouldn't come off. <laughs> so I was feeling uh, uh, a little bit under the gun there. So a few of the other guys, they were, they were kind of huddled up in like little cliques talking with each other. And uh, they were making these little smart aleck remarks to me here and there. And I'm just standing there wondering what was going on. And then all of a sudden, everybody in the room just went like that and got real quiet. So I looked behind me and Tear Air and one of the golden triangle-headed beings were standing there. They, everyone got immediately quiet. Next. Here's an image of the golden triangle headed being, about 10, 11 feet tall. And their, their arms and their legs, it almost looked like they were underwater. And they, they just, it was very weird. They're, and as you can see, their toes were like tripods and they kept going like up and down. They were, they were moving like this and kind of going up and down with their toes. It was very surreal looking. <laughs> Later on when I met, uh, went with the Anshar for when they got to meet the guardians for the first time, they were greeted by a golden triangle headed being and I got to see it a lot better. I was looking for zippers and all kinds of other stuff. I, but uh, I've, I look back and I could see the shape of its head going flat against this, this shield of a face. That's another angle. Another, I think, yeah, that's supposed to be animated as well, I think. Yeah. Raw Tear Air interfaces with me immediately and we invite questions from the audience. And we answered a number of questions, but the one that seems to stick out the most was one of the uh, SSP Alliance people asked, are you the raw from the law of one? And I, I waited for the response, and the response came, just came back, I am Raul Tier Air. And when I did this, they all just kind of looked at each other like, you know, that's not really a real answer. But I guess it was. Yes, my favorite meeting. <clears throat> that same month, I was told that I was going to be meeting with the Draco Alliance. And the Draco Alliance that I, the people, people I was going to meet with were uh, a Draco White Royal and some of the insectoids that were there with with the uh, Draco White Royal. That's supposed to represent me. And this 14 foot tall monster was a, uh, one of the top white royals. Uh, I've had a lot of people say it was inky and, and stuff like that. It, <clears throat> he gave me his name and it was nothing like that. It was a very Middle Eastern sounding name. <clears throat> I made the mistake of telling David, and he calls the name out all the time. And I'm telling him, do not say the name out loud. It's not a, not a good idea. <clears throat> <clears throat> this, what sticks out the most beyond how invasive this being was when it interfaced with you 
was the smell. It was kind of a musky urine smell. It was horrible. And there were, uh, I, I thought there were six, but Gonzalez said there were five women that were there that were obviously slaves. And um, <clears throat> as we left, we were able to bring them with us as a part of, uh, as a good faith towards the negotiation they were trying to uh, put, get us to take to the SBA. <clears throat> They were human girls, yes. They were all blondes. This was, I was taken by a, a different shuttlecraft to a, I, I'm believing it was somewhere in the southwest United States from the top of the, we landed on the roof of a hotel, an abandoned hotel. And <clears throat> looking out, I could see a desert environment. We went down an elevator that just like in the movies, a glass elevator in the front, and you look down, it's kind of like one of those garden hotels. And as we were going down, we could see all these beings standing out below us that we were, and it was just a very ominous feeling you're getting closer and closer and closer to them. <clears throat> and these were obviously very evil beings. <clears throat> At this point, the, the Royal White reached out and grabbed my mind. And immediately, I, I, all I could perceive was this being. Everything else in the room, I didn't even know existed. And its eyes started morphing, cha uh, changing uh, colors and, and just, I, I, re I really don't know how to explain it. It kept almost pulsating. And it, it took me off guard. I'd never had a being, uh, communicate with me that was that powerful. <clears throat> now, the hu there were humans there. There were humans there that uh, were a part of this um, committee of 200. And they overheard what was going on and reported it to the rest of their different cabal groups. And this caused, for a short time, a huge uprising among the cabal. Because this white Draco offered to leave all of their lower caste and human servants in the hands of the global authorities if they were allowed to leave from our solar system. So uh, this was seen as a major betrayal by a lot of these cabal groups and other non-terrestrials that are a part of that, this alliance. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was lucky enough not to be the one that delivered this <laughs> news, but uh, uh, the, the request was denied, and I refused to ever meet with another one of these beings ever again. And... Uh, not too long after Gonzalez had the same ex uh, experience as I did, he thought that I was exaggerating the, the power of this being. And, you know, it took three days to get over this etheric hangover that this being gave me. It was a massive headache all to the back of my skull. And then Gonzalez ended up having the exact same experience. I'm sure everybody remembers the Mars facility tour information. That occurred shortly after, and the ICC was uh, very upset about the information coming out about the intergalactic slave trade and, and some other information, and they wanted, and they didn't like us talking about the people on their bases being slaves. So they, as an olive branch, they wanted to take us to one of their facilities and give us a tour. But uh, they didn't know that one of the people that had defected from the ICC was a person who had lived on one of these bases and gave us intel on the base. Uh, we, we didn't really know that it existed. So when we were on our way to Mars, Gonzalez they put up a map and said, which of these facilities would you like to go to? And Gonzalez just called out some coordinates and the, the ICC 
representative was pretty shocked that we knew that it existed. Well, I guess one of the most interesting things that occurred on this, on this, and, and I'm abbreviating so we can get to questions. One of, the, one of the most interesting things that happened was when we were on, the, on this train, it was a train to where you sat in front of, you were facing the people, you were sitting in a line on both sides of the train facing each other. It was a, a narrow train. And I was asked by one of the people, where are you from? Because when I appeared there, I had been in the sun recently, I smelled like aloe, I, I did not smell or look like someone from outer space. And I, I made the mistake of saying, just real quick, I'm from Texas. And everybody looked shocked and started you know, shooting looks at each other. And I heard them murmuring to each other. And when the train stopped, we, uh, we had another train about 10, 15 minutes later pull up behind the train we were on. And a new detail of security guards came out and replaced the other ones. And the other security guards were, uh, they had their weapons removed and they were frog marched out. In, in the process, we got to go and um, look at the facility with all of the people interacting. And when we were, uh, I didn't know, but uh, there was already an arrangement that we were going to get to take one family back with us so they could be properly, um, I guess, interrogated or questioned about what was going on at that facility. And we figured out very quickly that when we brought this family on board our craft before we left, that there was somebody missing. And Gonzalez was very upset, and he stormed out and went to talk to the uh, facility commander and apparently that conversation didn't go too well because very quickly we had a security detail rushing out to our craft and put us under arrest. We were put in this cell that when we did the tour before we didn't see any signs of a prison or a jail and they walked us up to a wall and these doors just kind of appeared and opened and we walked in and there were all these cells and they walked us through to the back where they had a cell that would accommodate all of us. And they put us in, and uh, Gonzalez was saying it didn't look good for us, that uh, this base commander was a complete lunatic. And right when we were really starting to get worried, blue spheres came in, blue orbs came in the room, and took each and every one of us back to the LOC. And when we arrived at the LOC, it set off all these alarms because we weren't expected. And September 3rd, I went to the Inner Earth to meet Kari. This is an image that was created that shows the crystal caverns I was brought to when I was probably about 11 years old. We were walked out and uh, we were walked out and we spread out in sort of a semicircle in this area, and we were told to try to interface with the crystals, but not to touch them because it could damage us or the crystals. So we went in and we all interfaced with different crystals and really didn't think much of it, but apparently we were being used as sort of a USB drive. We were gathering information, and later on uh, through uh, the process that we would always go through, they would try, try to gain as much information as they can that we had absorbed. These are the raptors. The, the raptors had gotten control of these crystal caverns thousands of years ago. And they, they guarded them. They would not let anyone come to uh, visit the crystal cavern except for the cabal groups, and the cabal groups would bring a human as uh, a trade or a sacrifice to be able to uh, take people or, or to go to this crystal cavern, something I didn't know when I visited. When I visited, uh, it's 
a 100% chance that they handed someone over for that visit. Another image. That was uh, one of the beings that uh, they showed that lived under in the inner earth that uh, um, you'd usually, you didn't, you would very rarely see them. They were very skittish, uh, holding their little uh, ring saying precious, you know. <laughs> but uh, you would mainly just get a reflection of their eyes, a, a red, pinkish reflection of their eyes is pretty much what you would see. When I first arrived in the uh, inner earth area, it was a, um, it's kind of like a monastery. It was, it was a very monastic feel to the place. And when I walked in, I got a first uh, glimpse at not only these beings, there were two, two men on each door guarding the door, but the symbol above is a Vesca Pisces, and I didn't know what it was until I had uh, told David, and he told me what it was. Here's the area where I came in for the cleansing ceremony. And uh, that, that was very embarrassing for me. I, I was, took all my clothes off and was to cleanse in this pool of very cold water. I expected it to be warm or hot water, like geothermal water, but it wasn't. And, of course, that's when I first saw, or the second time I saw Kari, she came walking in, but I didn't differentiate her from any of the others because I hadn't really conversed with her yet. And the statue was a woman, it looked like she was holding a baby or a basket, and then she had her other hand out like this. And it was totally encrusted with like lime deposit kind of stuff. And you couldn't really clearly make out what the, the statue was at this point. But there was a port above her head that was about this big that water that this white water was coming out of and it they were there were stalactites that were building up around the port interesting enough after i described what i saw i received emails from all sorts of viewers stating that they had seen similar images depicting inner earth so there has there has been a, a lot of people that have visited these different groups in the inner earth other than myself, obviously, or these images wouldn't be coming out. You can just kind of click through them. Now, what's, what was interesting is that these huge pillars that were in this cavern, I can't even begin to describe how big this cavern was, but these pillars went up got narrow in the middle and then widened out again. And inside the rock pillars, they had built out all these different types of dwellings. And you could see the light coming from them, reflection of light off of the windows. Here's some commissioned art. This, this looks similar to what I saw. And right here you see uh, there were cigar egg-shaped and disc craft that were looked like a highway up above your head. They were coming and going, and they were disappearing into the rock wall of the cavern. They were going full speed, not slowing down at all, and just disappearing into the wall of the cavern. This was their garden. It was, it was very big. And that's, I guess, the highest vibratory food that we're gonna find. And then th this was the, the park area where I could hear different animals in the background. And there was an obelisk that was in the middle of this park that had a giant glowing sphere above it that was mimicking the sun. The, it was putting out full spectrum light. And I described this to David and it was right after he had commissioned the art for his new book, The Ascension Mysteries. And I, we, we almost didn't discuss this because it looks too coordinated. It looks like him and I work together, but the, the art, 
the art that uh, came out on his book was amazing because of the synchronicities. You can see, <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything. And then in the background, you see Saturn, which was the symbol that they were wearing. It, it, this was shocking to us. And uh, here's, here are images of the Inner Earth Alliance. The Anshar group, their eyes were just maybe 1% to 3% larger than ours, very, very hard to perceive. And this was one of the groups. This is the one that most people love to hate, the Omega group. They were very militaristic. And there, here's, the, here's Kari's group of the Anshar, the ones that had white hair. Oh yeah, I got the right one in. The, this group with, the, with a swastika on their forehead they had an area where a crystal was under the skin. And they, so they had a lump right here on their head that it kind of came, to, came together almost like a squinted eye. It was interesting looking. This is when I have my private meeting with Kari to where we have the mind meld. This was, this is still, uh, there is, I can't think of another incident that has affected me so dramatically. After this, I uh, changed my diet. I got off of uh, all pharmaceuticals. So it was, it was a pretty inspiring meeting. There's Kari. It's actually in the library. This was after she came and asked me if I wanted some of this amber a thick amber looking liquid and she said uh, it was the elixir of Isis. I turned it down but she had some and it seemed to relax her quite a bit. In the library when we appeared there there was a long golden rod that came from the ceiling with a hand holding a crystal ball and David Wilcock told me that that had been seen or reported in an underwater pyramid off of Bimini? Yeah, in 1968, Ray Brown found that crystal, and the only thing that we really knew was also a uh, rainbow phoenix with filled with diamonds. And, and we, there was a table with 12 chairs, and we, we reached and grabbed it and said, You have come what you, you have found what you come for, leave and never return. Yeah, it, it, was, it, it was just one of many things I saw around, so it really didn't jump out. But when I had an artist depict it, David thought it was fairly significant. In the library, there were documents all the way from scrolls to leading up to books that were leather bound or, and also bound with plant material. All, and all the way up to books that had ISBN numbers on them that looked like they were straight out off of, uh, they just ordered them off the internet. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. They walked us through this conference area where there were about a hundred or more of these egg-shaped chairs. And in group, you would see groups of people sitting around, the chairs would kind of be in a circle and they would be having, having a literal conference call together. And others were sitting in these chairs and they were projecting outward to all of us on the surface to impart knowledge, to motivate people. And, um, uh, and up until this point, they had been presenting themselves as non-terrestrial groups when uh, connecting with people psychically. They had one piece of crystal from this crystal cavern that did not show any type of aura. 
and they were trying to uh, they were trying to to get it to grow in this chamber and at at the point where I was there, it looked like they were unsuccessful. These are some images I had created of the Mayan breakaway group. Uh, wait, they're not in there? Oh, there we go. <laughs> <clears throat> they look very much like the Oompa Loompas in the, in the movie uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with Johnny Depp. It was uncanny. In their hair, they had these uh, braided buns, and going through their hair, they had strands of gold fiber through their hair that was really cool. And they had ponytails that were and the artist couldn't depict it for me. Um, ponytails that would wrap around this way and be real tight against their head, somewhere on this side and somewhere in the back at the bottom. And they were like long ponytails made into a circle and they were braided with this gold cord through them. And that's the real end of that first presentation. <laughs>
the physical event of the uh, uh, financial reset, are these similar? Have you heard about that or? They definitely sound similar, but I, I have not looked real deeply into COBRA's information still. So um, I don't know exactly where it correlates and doesn't correlate with the information I'm giving. Mm -hmm. But this, this final solar sneeze event is, it was, it's described and I was, I was shown an image or a visualization of it. The sun com had a complete ejection of its corona. It just ejected in all directions. And then the sun turned dark, like one of the dark spots, spots that you see on the sun. The entire sun was dark for a number of days after that. So, so it's possible we may have three days of darkness? Yes. Okay, interesting. Um, and of course, I've had several of these questions. Do we have any time frame for that? It's a window of opportunity, right? Yes. Well, the SSP Alliance had been using their probable future type of um, intel gathering and also information that they've received from non-terrestrials. And they had a time frame of 2018 to 2023 that they expected the solar sneeze to occur. OK. Um, after the event, will the Agarthans come out and pride, provide assistance to the surfer dwellers as they have in the past? Yes, after we have a full disclosure event or any other type of mass event that is going to raise our consciousness and let us know what has been going on, we have a number of groups that want to come and assist us. The Inner Earth Group is definitely one of them. They would like to uh, speed it up and come out and start working with us before this event. But in order to do so, they have to have uh, the Muhammad Accords have to be ratified. And the Muhammad Accords have nothing to do with Muhammad. They were, uh, it was a treaty that was signed by diff different non-terrestrial groups and inner earth groups right after the time of Muhammad. And during that time, they had open contact and sometimes open warfare in our skies between these different groups. And it was interfering with the uh, sociological progression of our species. So they decided that they would create this treaty and only manipulate us from the background through, you know, proxies, human beings that were part of the cabal. Um, do you have an uh, updated timeline uh, for the, oh, I guess the same question there. Um, what can we expect to happen at the time of this event? Will there be some people ascending before or after? Will there be intervention? Will some people be lifted up? Um, well, that, it, it's all up in the air right now. Right now, we are deciding what's going to happen. It's our, this co-creative reality that we share. Our consciousness, as we're, our consciousness is, is growing right now with all of these energies that are coming into the solar system. So this, the timeline has, has not been created yet or has not spliced off of this one to where we know exactly what's going to happen. There are a lot of potentials that could happen, but it, we're going to be the ones that ultimately decide what's going to occur as a mass consciousness. Have you heard anything about the people who um, will not um, ascend? I mean, is, is this still, is this wide open? Will some people be taking other planets? Has you heard about that or? Yeah, or, no. well, I, I really don't know, because like I said, it just depends on the type of ascension or event that ends up occurring that we develop with our mass consciousness. Mm -hmm. So you can't, we, no one can say r right now that this will, def it's definitely gonna happen this way. I, I did a remote viewing of a solar event to where there were these, this flash, 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 flash. And all of humanity um, saw it at the same time and these cabal groups, it was almost like weeble wobbles, those things that, you know, wobble like this. They kind of 
rolled back and just rolled off the planet. They just disappeared from this reality. And all of the remaining people joined hands and started singing and were looking at, the, at these clouds that were, looked like rainbows. Yeah. yeah. Different sources have indicated that when the grid comes down, of course, the uh, Agarthans and some of the ETs will be freer to come here. Uh, one, one girl named Bonnie said uh, that you'll know you're very close is when some electrical systems start to fail. Um, and I guess uh, we'll probably have some help. Uh, is there any confirmation well, on that about the grid? And oh, yeah. What's uh, that, and that was in my report. <clears throat> the the solar event is going to pretty much, it's, it's expected anyway, to wipe out our entire global grid, solar, um, electrical grid. Now, this sounds scary, but this will also create a situation to where all AI influences will be removed from the solar system in a literal flash. At that time, when we have all of the technology that we know of that's no longer working, the SSP Alliance has stated that this would be a perfect time to disseminate all the new technology to all of humanity at once. Well, that's good. I hope they're busy making a lot of it. Yeah, there's going to be a time period. This technology is going to come out, and then you have to wait for the research and development. It's going to take a while for us, a lot of this technology to actually get into our hands, but it'll be, it'll be out there. I heard the uh, Omnic Omnic said that, that the, some of the good guys will come down and will help us with that uh, after that. I'm sure they will. That, that's <laughs> wonderful. Everybody will be billionaires, basically. Not from money, but from the, the resources that we'll have. Would this take place before the a heliopause, or we don't know. That we don't know. It. It. That's a lot of the. Uh, that part is a lot. A lot up to us at this point. Okay. Can you describe the living condition of the workers of the ICC bases, industrial complexes in the moon, and other facilities? Are they all kind of like that one you went to, or are there various ranges of freedom and abilities? That, um, at that, at the Mars facility, that was the only time I saw living quarters. I had been brought to Mar other Mars facilities in the past when I was in the program, but we would come down when ICC didn't have assets in the area to fix a critical piece of hardware or equipment. We would come down and our expert would fix it for them, but we were always escorted and the the one area I remember going to, they did have a wall where people were putting up art and, you know, some stuff like that that made it, the place was a little bit cozier than the facility we toured. But the people had the same gaunt look to their faces. They, um, they were just kind of shuffling around in, in a zone in, in their own, you know, they, they were not happy looking people. And we were told not to make eye contact or speak with anybody. And when we would stop in an, at a certain area, uh, the security guys would say, eyes on your boots. We'd have to look down so we couldn't see what was occurring when certain doors were opening. This is when you were in the program? Yes. Okay. That, there was another question in here, and it seems natural to ask it now. Uh, you're out there for 20 years. Could we hear uh, uh, some of the type of things that you did? Um, were you mostly involved in... Uh, support in the bases, you went to other systems. Uh, maybe give us a, a jump to another system and what you did and, and what your position was and, and, and how did you spend 20 years? Uh, and give us some, maybe some highlights that you remember that, are, that you feel free that you could tell us about what you were doing for 20 years. Yes, I, was a, I didn't have a rank. They called me a specialist and I I helped the eggheads out quite a bit when I wasn't being used for uh, interfacing, which wasn't that often. So I would, the, the craft was completely modular. We would be 
we would open up the walls to make the craft real big to where we could take on um, cargo, or the walls would come back together and we would build out all these separate rooms for different experiments and different groups that were doing experiments. So it was a lot of work of you know breaking down, putting things back together. We had a lot of redundancy training to make sure everyone could do each other's jobs, as well as many, many, there were, you know, fire bad when you're in space. There were many fire drills. You spent a lot of time with a spray bottle and a rag going around cleaning the walls and the floors and uh, the area that you were assigned, and at the same time inspecting the area, looking for any types of cracks or, uh, you know, chemical uh, that had been rubbed off on it, you'd, you'd need to report that or do a chemical swab to identify the chemical for various reasons. And there was always this one spot in the area, there was a port, portal about this big that was glass, and there was always forehead grease right above it where people stopped and just leaned and were looking out the window. So whenever I was cleaning, every time that there was forehead grease there. <laughs> So a lot of maintenance. Tell us about one of the more exciting programs. It sounds kind of like uh, just you're, you're kind of like a, a construction kind of engineer. Uh, you act as an interfacing. Uh, give us some examples of your interfacing, um, maybe in another system, and, and what that was about, or I guess you didn't. The bulk of the interfacing I did while in the program was for the um, intruder intercept and interrogation program. And those were non-terrestrials that had come into the solar system without the proper clearance or giving a friend or foe signal. And many of them had been caught on the surface of Earth. Some of them had technology that if you, you were to look at them, they would look completely human to you. But if the ter technology was turned off, they would look completely hideous to you. And they had incidents to where they had pulled people that were like executives at companies in the middle of the day out of their headquarters on like, you know, 14th, 15th floor. And everyone in their company thought that they were a human, you know, their, their boss. But it turned out that this was a non-terrestrial. And they were, they were taken to facilities to where they were interrogated to see why they were there, um, who they were reporting to, where their support staff uh, was located in the solar system or beyond to get what information they could. Would they, did you get that information? Can you give us some examples? Yes, they, the interrogators were very effective. Basically, what they had intuitive empaths do is stand behind the glass and, and read these beings instead of interfacing with them to let them know when they were being, to let them know when they were being deceptive or when they were scared when they were the most vulnerable so they could apply certain tactics. It was uh, a very unnerving, uh, very unnerving job because these non-terrestrials were terrified. They were terrified. And what, what, what were they there for? What were they doing in that? As many different agendas as there were beings. No kidding. Yeah, some of them came in for um, quick raids to scoop up people. Uh, some of them had been responsible for taking entire villages in third world countries. So, and some of them were just here to study. You know, they were here to study the um, jungles, forests, or oceans, and many times they could care less what, uh, what we were doing other than how we were affecting uh, what they were studying. So they did have a little thing, kind of like Galaxy Quest, right, where they just I remember the comedian movie, but well, there was there was one being that I saw that it had it was sort of insectoid, it had sort of an insectoid body, but its face, it it looked I guess like a almost like a seahorse. It was, it was a very strange looking being, and it had like kind of like a separate bicep and tricep uh, that went like this that caused the the arm to move, and on the one of the segments that was part of the, the bicep, when they captured it, it had a kind of like a bracelet that was on, and when they would touch the bracelet, it would cause them to vibrate real quick, and you wouldn't be able to see them. They would be moving around, I guess kind of like, what's his name on, uh, 
No, the, it's a movie, the guy that moves real fast. Flash. Kind of like Flash, but it was, it was a recent movie. Um, Invisible, so, but they wouldn't phase out, they would just be in the room. As yeah, Invisible. he's just moving so fast that you can't, you can't perceive it. Okay. And some of, uh, some of the security, um, uh, one of the security guards had taken one of these devices, put it around his arm, and turned it on, and it shook him violently and broke his neck he, he, in his back. He died. So it just, it just shook him. He just went, it shook him, and he just died. That's a bummer. Curiosity yeah, it, killed security. Yeah, it didn't work on him. Okay. Um, do you have any knowledge regarding which group is behind the vaccination? Is that Draco, maybe the Omegans, or whatever? This uh, Earth -based uh, cabal? I worked at a... Uh, company, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies uh, in the United States anyway, and I did computer support, and I was supporting some of the uh, um, engineers, the biologists, and they were talking about all the stuff that goes into these, and they produced the, um, for the flu, the flu virus. And they said that there were insect, there was insect DNA in there, and all kinds of stuff that they said they would never give themselves or their family one of the shots. Yeah, um, for those of you who are listening out there, uh, do not vaccinate your children. They'll take them from you in the hospital. Uh, keep your babies close to you after they're born and say no to vaccinations. Do you know the population from Mars? <clears throat> no. Uh, for, for the SSP, maybe? Do you know approximately how many bases and what kind of numbers are there? Well, the ICC had over 100 bases, and this was probably, in, when I knew of it, it was probably in the early 1990s. And, and they were still building out. We're still building out. And were those, do, do you have any idea of the, of the size or numbers? Not really. Well, some of them were facilities that had, like I said, 250,000 people. A lot of them were real small, you know, with like 15,000 people. And there were other small outposts that were built that would just house maybe 28 or 30 security personnel on the surface. Uh, along that lines, uh, did you ever hear of uh, uh, this thing like Randy Kramer talked about, the, um, uh, the, the uh, insectoids and stuff on Mars? And that yes. Kind of thing that were coming out. And, uh, yeah, there, was, there were some insectoids that used sort of a biological technology, they would um, very quickly, I guess, clone a, out of their own genetic material smaller other beings that would act as weapons or, or go out and, and recon and do things for them. And they had a, um, there were incidents to where security personnel would see them walking the perimeter and they had a technology that made you see them as human and there would be when they would get back when the security guys would get back to their outpost after their shift I guess they would describe what they saw and each of them saw a slightly different thing they were not seeing the exact same they'd see a, a man with sandy brown hair another one would see a man with black hair they were not seeing the same thing okay um can you tell us, um, the SSP or uh, from any of the other positive uh, groups that you've contacted, uh, can you talk about, and I don't, you know, I don't want to necessarily call it Ananukai or the planet Nibiru, but is there any um, uh, information that you would say is definitive regarding a planet or a, or a dwarf star like Alex Collar says may be coming that comes through? Uh, causes changes in the solar system and eventually um, uh, heads out. Yes, and the, this Nemesis star does not enter our solar system. It, does, it has all of its effect on our star from very far outside of our orbit. And as it comes in to a closer orbit, there's a stronger electrical connection and several other types of ways that it interacts with our solar system that causes objects in the Oort cloud to be 
tossed towards the inner solar system. Now, yes, we're aware of the Nemesis star. I have not seen it up close other than through a remote viewing. As far as planets, there are <clears throat> quite a number of <clears throat> planets and planetoids ranging from the size of around a little bit smaller uh, than Pluto to extremely large, um, you know, about the size of Earth, that are in a wide orbit outside, uh, in, in the outside where the Oort cloud is. And they're, most of the big ones are not in the elliptic uh, plane like most planets are orbiting. They're sort of like uh, um, Pluto. It's about, what is it, like 17 degrees or something outside of the ecliptic. There are other very large bodies like that that are, that are rotating around the sun that are out there. Wow. So, so I guess uh, our solar system has uh, many, many more planets. <clears throat> yes, there are more planets and uh, moon planetoid sized. Okay. Um, the other question uh, in here is, um, oh, when the planet has its influence in the Oort cloud and it's it, is it start sending projectiles to the system? Are these possibly a danger? Can they hit the Earth? Will the Earth be shielded by the SSP? Is it possible the benevolence will protect that? Or is it just random they're going to let it happen to other worlds? And does it cause volcanic activity? There are some groups that would not interfere, that uh, say they just let nature progress the way it should. There are other beings that are very um, vested in what's going on on Earth that have invested in these 22 different genetic um, programs. The, I guess they've been referred to as the uh, genetic farmer races. They're very invested in this experiment on Earth, and they would most likely protect us. Okay, we have the genetic farmer races, and we've heard the word harvest. We spoke the other day, you and I, and that kind of puts a, a, I guess, a dialectic for the human populace to be kind of like, you know, uh, just seen as an experiment, whereas w I was thinking maybe it would be more like there's a graduation, we're looking here, and some people are going here, and some people are staying in the third grade, some people are going to the seventh grade, some people are moving on into to di different areas. Um, could you talk a little bit about this genetic experiment, as far as you know it, and maybe put a friendly, happy face on it for us so we're not like <laughs> harvested well, and what, you know, all that yeah. stuff. Is this a soul well, harvest? Um, I believe the person in the in the law of one, Carla, the when you're contacting in contact with these beings, they're going to use language that's familiar to you. And from what I'm told, she was um, a very strong Christian, and that is language that is used in the Bible. So this was language that she was familiar with that was being used to communicate with her. I was that was another question I was going to ask because in the law of one they had the Bible. And also, um, cosmic awareness, uh, the Dr. Beter uh, symbiosis group there from way back in the 70s was bringing some of this information forward, um, had very specific uh, abilities or ways to communicate with the channel uh, that was, or I guess, a vehicle of the oracle. Um, can you comment a little bit on um, what the raw tear group um, talks about the Christ in my head, a conversation, the first interview with you, I asked, uh, you said, well, they, the Christ, and, and you said they nodded and affirmed, and I was like, I wanted more information. They nodded, affirm, uh, whatever, dude, or we understand and know and respect that being. And you said, no, they nodded that they understand and respect that being. Can you share what you know about uh, the incarnation of, of Christ and the Christ consciousness um, for this planet and for the universe as it relates to um, planet Earth? Well, the blue avians, when I was going through the period of trying to figure out 
what the heck they were because when I was in the secret space program, I'd never heard of eight foot tall blue birds, never. So I, when the contact began, began I, was, I was a little concerned and I wasn't just you know, going on my knees saying, tell me more, tell me more. Like I said, I was looking for zippers. I was looking for any weird signs that something weird was going on. And <clears throat> I decided, you know, test the spirits, like, you know, I was told growing up. So I asked them um, their stance on Jesus. And they, they bowed and showed reverence and stated that they had much, they had much respect for Jesus and his teachings, and that their teachings are the same. Very good. Very good. Thank you. They're, well, they're the same as his before they got distorted, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Before it got distorted, yeah. Before humans got a hold of it and used it as a control yeah, system. Just yeah. it around. Um, how has uh, your coming out affected your children, your wife, and your other friendships of family <clears throat> or family? Pretty, right now, with my family, I can tell the cat's out of the bag a little bit. Cause my nephew has been asking me questions. He's saying, I see you on the internet a lot with this other guy with yellow hair. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And uh, he asked me what these big blue balls are. And I'm like, ooh, okay. So I, I, he's like nine years old. I doubt he's uh, surfing and finding this on his own. I, I think my family has looked into it, seen it, but they don't know how to approach me on it. As I said before, I fully expect at some point to come for Thanksgiving and for there to be an intervention with the, <laughs> uh, with the preacher from our church and <clears throat> all that. So I'm already prepared to sit there and smile and nod, and I'll take any prayers anyone wants to give me anyway. So, so I've been expecting that, but... <clears throat> It's, it's had an effect on, there, there's been some stuff that we don't make public that has occurred around the house. And uh, it's affected my wife. She's gone into some, quite a bit of depression here and there. Um, <clears throat> because she just recently aw uh, awoken in the last couple of years. And so this was still extremely new, all new concepts for her. You know, she... She really wasn't that much into science. She didn't really understand celestial mechanics. And so I, it, it, there was a lot of Q&A like is going on here with her. Well, that's good. I hope that uh, everything stays stable for you and your family and everyone stays happy there. Um, what is the kind of swoosh and all the NASA symbols represent? The, oh, the, sh uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, they called them, we're calling them chevrons, I believe, but it is a representation of the secret space program, and also there are apparently two similar shaped, I don't know if they were satellites or, or craft that they had found in the early years of, of NASA that they had found when they were looking into the heavens that were in orbit around the Earth for a while. And supposedly they had made contact with, with whichever group this was. Uh, if you don't um, mind, would you share your personal healing experiences with Kari? Yes. Um, the mind meld that we had was such an intense experience that I have not been the same since. She sat directly in front of me and we leaned over like this and we had our hands out and she put her hand into my hand like this and I felt myself pull out of my body and stop in, directly in between the two of us and she came out as well and we kind of blended in the middle. And as I stated, I began to see all these different time periods of her life as she was looking at those time periods of my life. What occurred more than anything was we had a, share, a sharing of vibration, of energy, and I carried that with me afterwards. And she said that 
because of the way that we had interfaced, she was connected to me in a way that would have her looking in on me for the rest of my life. Okay. The healing and changes occurred in uh, just a kind of an organic fashion. They just kind of, you know, I all of a sudden didn't want to eat meat anymore. I started losing a lot of weight. And as I stated, <clears throat> I was finally able to, I was going through a lot of surgeries. I was on pain meds. I was on different pharmaceuticals. And um, the doctors told me, you've been on these uh, pain meds and muscle relaxers, Xanax. They had me on all kinds of stuff. And they said that I most likely am chemically dependent on them and it was gonna be, it was gonna take a long protracted process to get me off of them. But I was able to quit all of them cold turkey with no symptoms. <clears throat> Have you heard anything about chemtrails and what we can do to protect ourselves from those? Is there anything that you, do you know like what, what's in that soup? No, um, I, 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 I'm not real familiar with chemtrails other than there's, um, they've observed tankers, non-terrestrial tankers that are, um, both dumping gases and um, other things on populated areas, but these same vessels they've seen uh, move over the ocean and lakes and, and pulling large amounts, amounts of water out. Uh, other than that, I don't know about the agenda or all the details of uh, chemtrails, and I don't know about the details about 9-11 either. We so. spoke yesterday, you mentioned that there's <laughs> both positive groups putting in good things in our atmosphere as well. Is that correct? Right. Okay. How can we help or advise others about ascension if one in 2,300 will move forward into the next vibrational dimension? I guess that means right now. Um, right. Well, it's nice to advise others on ascension, but the best way to affect others is to walk the walk. Make the changes in yourself and be an example. Let them see. If they see that you're happy, you're blissful, they're going to want a piece of that in this world. It, everything's so dark. So they're going to come to you, and they're going to, or they're going to observe you quietly to figure out how they can have that. You know, the, it was a shocking small number that Thierry told me about. He said less than 300,000. And when I did that, David pulled out his calculator to find out the percentages and all that. <clears throat> but this information, it was delivered as a cosmic wake-up call. For all of us that think that we're already in that number, guess what? You're most likely not. It means you need to really work right now on on stopping the wheel of karma through forgiveness of yourself and others. Uh, if you stop the wheel of karma, you're gonna be able to run faster. You're not gonna have this parachute behind you that's slowing you down. How many of the world leaders are aware of the secret space program, harvest, this, this whole very, dynamic? Very few. Some of them are read in a little bit. They may get the uh, master briefing that a lot of these secret, uh, lower secret space program members get, that uh, first they come and massage your ego, say you're so valuable, um, you know what, we're going to put you on the top need to know information, you're at the top of the totem pole, and the people, they believe it. Their egos kick in and they're like, okay, there's nothing above this. So some, there are some world leaders that have had that type of briefing, but for the most part, they hear things from constituents in the military and that kind of thing, but they can't get any real information on it. Okay. Um, and I guess these are probably stars. Do you know what happened to MH370 and MH17? I'm not sure what that is. No. Okay. Uh, what is it? Oh, 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 those are airlines. Okay. Yeah, Gonzalez did tell me that uh, there was activity at... Uh, what is it, Diego Garcia, um, that um, coincided with one of the craft disappearing. Um, I've, I haven't had any confirmation, but I've heard all of the same um, conspiracies and rumors about the 
the two disappearances. But there, it was, there was some sort of operation. I don't have the details. We don't know why or who. <clears throat> no. Okay. Um, can you talk about, or had you describe any other inner Earth civilizations other than the ones you've mentioned on cosmic disclosure? There's obviously many, many different Agarthan networks. Yeah, there's, there are many more. These were the, uh, uh, this group was, are the only ones that I've been introduced to or have met, but they are the most influential of the inner Earth groups the largest in, uh, population wise and the most influential. Those artists' depictions, were those, those, those pictures that we saw in, the, in your pr program, were those part of the, uh, did you have those made or those just? I had those, <clears throat> Vashta, an artist, mm -hmm. uh, created those for me when we worked together. They are, they are fairly accurate representations of what I saw. Okay. Um, can you give us a description of some of the ETs that attend the uh, secret uh, space, I guess, briefing meetings? <clears throat> well, the... we, don't, <clears throat> we don't normally have non-terrestrials present at briefings. <clears throat> the only time that I've ever been at a secret space program internal briefing where there were non-terrestrials was when I was at the, the meeting where the Blue Avian and the Golden Triangle headed being appeared. <clears throat> Otherwise, they're they're closed, closed meetings. We don't non-terrestrials aren't there. So, I think you mentioned <coughs> that you uh, uh, w there's only one meeting where you had uh, there was a meeting. I thought that you were uh, doing it as a delegate for like a lot of different the super, super federation. federation yeah. yeah, but there were not no <clears throat> Earth people there. No, there was. Uh, when I would go, when I was younger, we had one delegate station that was a rotating seat. Um, different members from the Secret Earth syndicates would rotate members in to sit at the seat at different meetings. But they had to fight very hard, and it took a long time for them to get invited to uh, this meeting. Can you tell us at the Super Federation meeting of 40 when Rod Tier, I guess th there are many groups that had, you'd mentioned that they had been caught on the earth, have been trying to go somewhere. Can you talk about um, what they look like, or where they're from, or what, what was going on there? Well, <clears throat> yeah, there were some that looked very human. I described the one, the very odd looking one, that had this segmented looking insectoid body, but this, this weird head that kind of came together, almost like a seahorse. <clears throat> there were um, several groups. There was one group that they would run into quite often that looked like human beings, maybe from the Mediterranean, that they always had real short black hair, very muscular, and they're about, you know, 5'5", five, 5'8", five, five, but they were, they were very dense. These people would weigh like five, 600 pounds. And you would look at them, and they would look just like a kind of a, you know, a thick, muscular person. You would think they w weighed around our, our weight, but they were extremely dense and strong. Can you describe um, uh, the Mayan group when you? It, I think you went there, didn't you, to the Pleiades and they did <clears throat> the healing, or did you? No, just, were you on a craft? I was. I was picked up. Their craft was made out of rock. It was a giant stone cylinder. And when you walked inside the craft, you were walking the walls, the floors, the ceiling were all like polished stone. It was like they somehow just cut it out of the middle of a mountain and then just had it appear in space. And the technology was just magical. It was all consciousness technology. There were um, some things that just looked like um, stones that were kind of a weird shape that were floating in the middle of the floor that were uh, technology that we would look at and it just looked like a kind of a floating carved stone. Uh, Corey, have you heard or read anything on the glass pad about the um, 
Lemurian civilization and uh, can you confirm that they are part of the Mount Shasta? Um, Garden, yeah, I, I can't Garden confirm Island. if they're a part of Mount Shasta or not. If the term Lumeria was used when I was looking at the smart glass pad when they were talking about the ancient uh, breakaway civilizations, I don't know. I, I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with Lemuria before I went in the service, so um, a lot of times I would see information and I, I, it would be like if I saw Lemuria, it would just be like any other uh, name or term that was being used. But they confirmed that some of these groups had uh, moved under the ground during cataclysms and had brought Earth humans with them over uh, other periods of cataclysms. Okay, we talked about this last night. We talked about the different implant uh, matrix and entity attachments and uh, the plasma scalar field that you said were all under mind control. I think that's the last one. Mm -hmm. um, I guess someone's asking, um, how can we neutralize that? What, what is the best way for us to um, overcome uh, the matrix um, uh, technology? The best way <clears throat> to overcome the mind control and the various technologies that are used to um, control our behavior is to raise your vibration. And you do that through all the ways that this group is going to know how to do. You you got to meditate on a daily basis. You've got to treat your body like a temple. You need to get on a high vibratory diet. And most of all, you need to start working on, the, on these inner things that we've been talking about. <clears throat> if you stop the wheel of karma, then you're freed up to work on on raising your vibration even more. You're not going to have anything pulling you back. So it's doing, if you do all the things that you're supposed to be doing, you're going to mitigate any um, uh, mind control that is being used on you. Okay. Um, someone asked, um, is there a, also a blue sphere that exists around uh, the 50 plus nearest nearest star systems that you talked about? No, the, the local star cluster, each star system is going through or has gone through what we are going through now. Some of them have <clears throat> gone through it thousands of years ago. Some of them are right where we're at. There's at least one other pl planetary system <clears throat> that is in the same place that we are and is trying to uh, regain its freedom and these energetic changes are, are occurring in, in various stars at different times. So there's no, they don't have the need to put one of these spheres around the entire local star cluster. Okay. Um, how is it possible for me, or I guess it would be for anyone to know, if they were part of a secret space program or any program? <clears throat> yeah, <that's, clears throat> if you don't have a decent recall of, of incidents, it's going to be pretty difficult. If you're having a lot of dreams and partial memories of being in space, of seeing certain scenes over and over again on bases or in craft, that's a good sign that either you are in a program or you've just been taken up there on multiple occasions. So it's best not to jump to a conclusion. You know, I remember being inside um, <clears throat> vessels with uh, Earth military people, therefore I must have been in the secret space program. That's not necessarily true. You could have just been my lab. So the, the best bet is to find if you feel like there's something, you know, there that you need to remember better, find a reputable regression therapist who has a degree in uh, psychology, psychiatry is, is the best to find. But most of all, you want one that's been doing it for at least 10 years. <clears throat> Otherwise, you can do more harm than good. Some of these people accidentally implant memories in people. So you have to be very careful who you, whose, mind, who, whose hands you put your mind in. Why was it so important for the U.S. government to hide the knowledge of ETs in the 50s? I mean, <clears throat> well... It sounds simplistic, but they try to say 
they were doing the responsible thing because none of you can handle it. You would all freak out, suck your thumb, and go into the fetal position. <laughs> That's literally what they think. But the real reason is that all of the people that controlled the military industrial complex also had their thumb in the oil industry, pharmaceuticals, banking, and they saw if, if they wanted to suppress these technologies but let us know about non-terrestrials, well, first thing we're going to ask is, how did they get here? What kind of technology do they have? And that's just going to open up the can of worms that they want to keep closed. If they were to disclose non-terrestrials, they would have to disclose technologies that would have collapsed their control system. In the financial system, uh, Dr. Frank Changes says uh, that uh, Laura's great-grandfather said, um, we've looked at this and um, it would cause too much problems and our financial system was one of that the things. That was his thing, that was everybody else's. Right, he took, it was the advice. I mean, I don't know, maybe that he was well, I know that threatened. Said, listen to the president, mm -hmm. and this is a quote that Frank Changes <clears throat> Yeah, there was one group right. that, yeah, uh, right. the Eisenhower administration, um, there was one non-terrestrial group. They met with like six in a short period of time. One of the groups had claimed to be our creators. They claimed that they had come here many thousands of years ago. They had created us from basically um, a root race that was here. And back in the 50s, most of the military people were right-wing, Bible-thumping Christians. And anything that said humans were older than 7,000 years old or may have been created by another being did not fly. They, um, they were very suspicious of it to begin with. They thought that they were being manipulated. So there, there was a component of these groups believing that if, if information got out about non-terrestrials creating us, that it would, it would destroy religion and all of our belief systems and wreak havoc. There's some of them legitimately believe that. Um, <clears throat> if the blue sphere being fully pulled away from the sun and allow the full emanations to flood the earth, um, is that when all the AI will be wiped out? Do they, or is that the, well, the, the sun? The spheres are there to attenuate the energy coming from the sun. And as we get further in this process, the spheres are slowly fading away. And at some point, they're just going to disappear. And then at that point, we're supposedly going to be acclimated enough to handle this full influx of energy. Otherwise, we would all suffer from what they call end time madness. You know, we, we would just, most of us would just go nuts. And we're already seeing a lot of that with with uh, the energy being buffered. Can you talk about the Draco Orion Rigel uh, story? We hear about um, that the Draco are from the Orion and the Rigel system. Um, are there, there good guys there too? And what was that history? Well, I've heard from several different sources where the reptilians supposedly come from. The, some of them have stated that they actually came from here. That this planet had pretty much been stolen from them by non-terrestrial groups that wanted to start this grand experiment with a human type of being. And that, <clears throat> that, that is what I've heard. Now, they reside in a lot of different star systems, most of the star systems they re reside in are star systems they have conquered. So it's hard to know the real history of a deceptive being. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, Corey, I was awake. No, I wasn't awakened, but someone was awakened at 3 a.m. a couple of months ago with an electronic beep. They opened their eyes to, very, to see a very small blue sphere, translucent floating six inches above the bed. They sat up and looked at it, and it felt like it was looking at me. Is this a type of spear being contact? I've never heard the electronic sound associated with it. 
that raises my eyebrows a little bit. But yeah, I I can't even I can't even read the emails anymore of all the people that are having blue orb experiences. Many have ne never heard of me or cosmic disclosure. They go and they just start searching blue sphere, blue sphere, you know, and and here we are. We pop up. Um, Justin uh, DeCamps was telling me a story just recently. He ran into a guy that had no idea who I was, and the guy started talking about him and his girlfriend were laying in bed, and a sphere came in the room, flew around, a blue sphere, and, and left. And Justin talked to him a little bit, and it turned out that the guy had no idea who I was or any idea about the blue spheres. So this is this is happening to a lot of the population of Earth. Many, many, many people are seeing these blue orbs. And most of the time when a blue orb appears, they're imparting some sort of information or there to, as your wake-up call. <clears throat> Can you tell us, are there still gray abductions going on? Um, they seem to have kind of dropped out of the limelight. What, what's your story on the gray? Yeah, they've, they have reduced, but they're, they still have a treaty to where they're allowed to do that here. So, <clears throat> yes, is that, they're... Is that treaty through our government? Yeah. It was a treaty agreed on uh, very early by our government. And uh, we do the best we can to manage them, to track them, to find out who they're abducting. Uh, there's also the breeder program where you hear people being abducted and having all kinds of... Uh, um, things done to their reproductive systems, including being impregnated and babies removed. There are several non-terrestrial groups that are involved in what they call the breeder program, and including the greys. Can I ask? Yes. Yes. That's how hybrids are, hybrids are created in the breeder program. Can, can I ask, the question was, um, what was your question? What did you say? Yeah, how are, were hybrids created Is that in this how breeder program? Hybrids are created, yeah. And, yes. Um, and I'd like to ask a follow-up question there. Um, can, can we um, identify any of those abductions and taking and doing the breeder programs as, uh, as benevolent and part of a, a conscious agreement, or are these kind of abductions and violating of free will? Well, some of the people that are being abducted are actually human incarnations of these beings. This grand experiment, these beings aren't here conducting the experiment. They're a part of the grand experiment. Many of these super federation groups will incarnate in human bodies to go through the process that we go through. And also, they are monitored and picked up by uh, the non-terrestrial group that they're, they're from, their soul group that monitors them throughout their life here on Earth as a part of the experiment. Corey, has the Blue Sphere Alliance or any of the groups you were in contact with ex expressed an interest in recruiting intuitive uh, em empaths uh, through you as opposed to other established channels? No, um, there, there has been no communication with me trying to get me to recruit empath, intuitive empaths for, for them, no. Okay. Why are so many uh, people, especially young people, dealing with mental illness today? Uh, well, <clears throat> we've got a large, large group of young people that are coming into this world that have never been in it before, that are higher density non-terrestrial beings that are coming here to assist us during this very pivotal time. And I'm convinced that there is a fair number, there are a fair number of these beings in this room right now. Oh, the mental illness, yes. Um, <laughs> not that part. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, the, the reason that they're showing signs that uh, resemble mental illness is they, they don't like being here. They can't, they can't take living in this density. It's like living underwater. 
and they, they, they just can't handle it. And if they succumb to these feelings before they are awoken, then they're, they're going to think that they're crazy because they have this knowledge, they have these experiences that don't make sense in this physical world that all of us live in. Can you talk about, or I'm sorry, can you describe the Mayan breakaway healing experience? Or did we already do that yesterday? Yeah, we did that. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, how, can uh, we, a how repeat many, question. How many uh, questions are we going to do? Because I have to drive to Sacramento right after this. Yeah, we're, okay, very quickly here, I guess. Um, I want to answer as many as I can, but I don't want to. Yeah, okay, um, <laughs> I guess you, you got to go. Um, are there hybrid reptilian humans that get free of control and the matrix? You know, I have not heard of, of that scenario. Most of the uh, reptilians are far more controlled than we are even. They're, most of them have, are infested with nanites or are just energetically controlled by the higher caste beings. So when this event occurs and it destroys any AI in their bodies, some of these uh, reptilians are going to be very confused. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it would be interesting to see what they're like when they're not under this control system, this negative control system. They may have an opportunity themselves to change. Okay, um, I, uh, I wanted to kind of, I guess, end it on a, a, a kind of a neutral or kind of a positive yeah, question. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, so. uh, can you um, confirm um, uh, or talk about a feline species? Yeah. <clears throat> this is a higher density species that they don't need, they don't need craft. They just appear before people. <clears throat> there's been a capture or kill order out on them for some time, sadly, by the, the various secret space programs. And I actually saw one of these lavender-looking beings after they had been killed. Mm. And they had used some sort of uh, uh, electric net or some, some sort of device that captured them. And it, this being had been electrocuted, was burned. It, had a very bad death, and it's sad because these are very loving, benevolent beings, and the secret space program wants to interrogate them. Yeah, so yeah. They've, they've had a killer capture order out on them for some time. Wow, and so kind of like that movie Time Jumper, they have a net. That yeah, they got oh yeah, like, yeah, jumper. Wow. No. Well, folks, we've, we've had a, a lot of questions. We did not get to everyone, but I, I hope you're happy that we got through quite a, a few of your questions. Corey Good, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's been an honor to meet everyone here.